Julio is a really newly appointed faculty member because he started the 1st of November this year, but he has been working since 2015 uh, in uh, the Humanitas Research Hospital as a cardiologist. Uh, he graduated uh, uh, at La Sapienza University in Rome in medicine and surgery, and then he did a specialization in cardiology in the same university. He received his postgraduate degree as cardiologist uh, uh, in 2011. And then uh, he did a PhD in experimental medicine and systems medicine uh, in the University of Tor Vergata, but working uh, since 2012 uh, in uh, Switzerland, in Bern, at the uh, university hospital as a, Swiss, as a senior fellow, fellow uh, of the Swiss National Science Foundation in the Department of Cardiology. And then he came back to Italy and started working here. Uh, he is a member of the editorial board of uh, important international journal, besides being uh, really a, a young scientist. He is an uh, associate editor of uh, your intervention. He is in the editorial board of scientific reports and also uh, associate editor of BMC Cardiovascular Disorders. He received important awards, among the, which the William Harvey Prize of the Italian Society of Cardiology, and he was among the finalists of the Lynn Mayer Spirit of Intervention Cardiology Young Investigator Award in 2012. And this year, he received a scholarship of the European Society of Cardiology for an executive Master of Science in Health Economics, Outcomes and Management in Cardiovascular Sciences at the London School of Economics. Uh, his main research and clinical interests uh, concern interventional cardiology, in particular uh, coronary artery revascularization and the use of medicated stents. Uh, and he is considered a young key opinion leader in the field of uh, coronary revascularization and coronary stents. He has already published 76 papers in international journals and has an H index of 19. So today, Julio will give us a seminar entitled Percutaneous coronary revascularization, the impact of technological advances on clinical outcome. So, good afternoon to everybody. I thank you a lot, uh, Professor Duga, for this nice introduction. It's my pleasure to be here and honor to start working at this university. Exactly, for the next 20 minutes, I will kind of guide you through a journey into the history of PCI, percutaneous coronary revascularization, mainly focusing on the impact of technological advances on clinical outcomes. So uh, looking at this celebrative article published already four years ago in the New England Journal of Medicine, you can appreciate that over the last 50 years, cardiovascular mortality has decreased significantly. And uh, Eugene Brownwald is in this article highlighted the scientific advances that had an impact on cardiovascular mortality. And you can appreciate that at least four of them actually are based on percutaneous coronary interventions. So this technology indeed had an impact on patient outcomes. Actually, the first PCI, the first balloon angioplasty, was performed in 1977 by Andreas Grunzig, who you see here with the moustache in these pictures, on this patient here, Mr. Backman in Zurich. He, he was a patient with a stenosis of the proximal LAD, and uh, Dr. Grunzig proposed him to, instead of undergoing coronary artery bypass surgery, undergo a new technology which was based on the dilation of a balloon catheter within the coronary artery. The intervention worked quite well, and what you can see in this picture is the results in year 2000. Actually, the patient underwent a new uh, coronary angiogram in Bern in year 2000, and uh, the result was quite good. You can see it here, still opened. He actually underwent a stent implantation a few years later, but actually, you know, the result was good. There was no progression of disease. So certainly an excellent novel technology, which revolutionized the treatment of coronary artery disease. The next step actually was the development and uh, use of coronary stents. This happened 10 years later. Coronary stents are mainly metallic prosthesis that are implanted within the coronary artery. What happened in June 1986 is that Ul Ulrich Sigvard uh, implanted a stent after having dilated the coronary artery with a balloon. You can see here the initial stenosis. After the balloon dilatation, the coronary artery was completely closed. He then implanted a stent to optimize the result and also worked quite well. 
What are the advantages of coronary stenting over balloon angioplasty? Well, certainly the mechanical stabilization of the artery, meaning stabilization of vascular dissections at the site of balloon angioplasty, the prevention of constrictive arterial remodeling after the balloon dilatation, and of course the improved lumen patency and coronary flow over time, avoiding vascular remodeling. Certainly, there are some net negative aspects associated with the implantation of metallic prosthesis, which are based on the vascular in injury at the site of device implantation. But what were the immediate clinical benefit of stenting? Well, you can see them here. There was a dramatic reduction in the risk of periprocedural death, of periprocedural MI, and emergency cabbage. However, PCI is also associated with the risk of recurrent stenosis, meaning re-stenosis within the treated coronary segment. And also there, coronary stent had an, uh, were delivering an improvement. You can see that after dilatation with a balloon, you have two phenomena that uh, determine re-stenosis. On a side, recoil and negative remodeling, which contributes for 50%. And on the other side, the uh, formation of new tissue within the coronary artery, which determines a new occlusion of the vessel. Well, certainly stents address the issue of recoil and negative remodeling since they scaffold the vessel, keeping it opened. However, metallic stents were still affected by the presence of new tissue within the stent, meaning wrist stenosis due to neointimal hyperplasia. And uh, what you can see here is the effects of wrist stenosis of metallic stents, as I said, by addressing the issue of uh, negative remodeling and acute recoil, they significantly reduce the rate of wrist stenosis. However, you can see the columns in, in yellow. Still, patients undergoing bare metal stents implantation were suffering wrist stenosis in up to 37% of cases. And the new advance in this field was then the introduction of drug eluting coronary stents. Drug eluting stents are mainly based on the same metallic uh, prosthesis that is uh, the main component of uh, metallic stents. However, they are also based on another two component, a polymer coating, which allows the delivery of what you see in blue here, an antiproliferative drug, which is delivered site specifically at the site of stent implantation and inhibits the cell cycle at different levels, mainly uh, inhibiting the proliferation and migration of vascular smooth cells within the uh, uh, treated vessel and therefore uh, almost eliminating the risk of restenosis. You can see that several antiproliferative drugs have been proposed for this scope. And the introduction of drug eluting stents actually allowed PCI to become the most frequently performed therapeutic intervention in medicine worldwide with, with over 2 million patients, sorry, over 2 billion patients treated every year around the world. So, but what is the device safety and efficacy profile of drug eluting stents? You can see here that the introduction of drug eluting stents has expected, has led to a dramatic reduction in the risk of repeat revascularization, with a number needed to treat of around 6 to 8, 7 to 10, depending on the device use, and mainly apparently no impact on mortality, as compared to the implantation of bare metal stents. However, this improved benefit in terms of effectiveness, meaning the risk of repeat revascularization, came at the price of a delayed art, uh, healing response at the arterial site of device implantation, which lo with local inflammation and positive vessel remodeling and neoatherosclerosis and coronary vaginations, which was then associated with an increased risk of very late thrombosis of the implanted device. This was an observation of already 10 years ago, which actually uh, was quite important in the field since it highlighted how the need for novel improvement in this technology was urgently required. And you see here a case example of a patient that actually was treated with a uh, drug eluting stent. He came back five years later. This actually is a patient that I treated in Bern. And uh, uh, I performed some intravascular imaging, uh, observing some remodeling of the vessel. You see here these evaginations between the stent struts. We found it at good result. However, we observed it. And actually, the patient came back six months later with a thrombosis of the stent. So it, this phenomenon, this local phenomenon, has an impact on the risk of thrombotic events. However, during the last 10 years, an important 
progress has been made in the drug eluting stem technology with the use of novel antiproliferative drugs, novel polymer materials, and novel platform materials, which allowed the development of devices with smaller thickness and more biocompatibility. And this was reflected actually by the arterial healing process at the site of the implanted device. You can see here restenosis, typically of bare metal stents, early generation DES, drug looting stents, DES stents for drug looting stents, which actually were, were associated with this phenomenon of delayed arterial healing and an improved arterial healing with uh, new generation drug looting stents. In terms of clinical outcomes, uh, we, in Bern, we performed one of the first trials showing improved clinical outcomes with these new devices. So the hypothesis was that a better biocompatibility uh, associated with the use of a new device would have improved late clinical outcomes in terms of thrombotic events. And you see here the results of this trial, the readers' trials uh, published in 2011 in The Lancet, which actually showed an improved uh, uh, overall outcome in terms of, of a composite primary endpoint in favor of the new device as compared to the early generation device. What was also interesting of this trial was that we observed a marked benefit in terms of thrombotic event, meaning stent thrombosis, occurring after the first year of follow-up. And what we did next was trying to associate this stent thrombosis benefit, meaning the risk reduction in terms of stent thrombosis after the first year, with the primary endpoint of the trial to see whether the treatment effect with respect to stent thrombosis was having an impact on the primary endpoint of the trial. How? Well, we perform a, an interesting analysis looking at events of the primary endpoint not associated with stent thrombosis, and we observe no differences between the two groups within the first year and after the first year. And then we looked at events associated with stent thrombosis. Again, no difference within the first year between the two groups, but the entire difference was led by events associated with stent thrombosis occurring after the first year of follow-up with a significant interaction between treatment effect and time, therefore providing a mechanistic explanation for, this, for the observed benefit. Similar results were also observed with other new generation devices, such as a, this is an Everolimus looting stent based on a durable polymer. This is a nice study published by a colleague here at Humanitas, uh, Giuseppe Ferrante, a couple of years ago in uh, the British Medical Journal, again showing an improved safety profile of a new device as compared to an early generation device in terms of cardiovascular death and stent thrombosis. Actually, this was not limited, this benefit was not limited to de novo coronary artery, but also to treatment failures. I mean, patients that were coming back because of restenosis of an implanted device also were had a benefit from the implantation of a new generation device rather than an early generation device, as actually summarized in this study published last year in The Lancet. Uh, and overall, you can see the uh, um, outcomes associated with device iteration in terms of efficacy and safety. So here we are focusing on device-oriented outcomes on a side efficacy measured by target lesion revascularization, on the other side safety measured by stent thrombosis. And you can appreciate that there was a progressive improvement in terms of efficacy with device iteration from the blue of bare metal stents to the red of early generation drug looting stents to the uh, light blue of new generation drug looting stents. And this was paralleled by an improved safety profile of new generation devices as compared to early generation devices. And this led actually to a document of the European Society of Cardiology, which I had the honor to take part of, which was a, a, a document on the evaluation of coronary stents published last year in the European Heart Journal, which mainly uh, uh, concluded that the technology is quite mature, and to arrive to this conclusion, we performed a systematic review of all the available randomized controlled trials in the field, and you can appreciate in this figure how the progress uh, with device technology was associated in all available trials with a significant progress in terms of clinical outcomes, meaning death, myocardial infarction, target lesion revascularization, and definite stent thrombosis. But how did this ha impact on clinical use of percutaneous coronary interventions and drug looting stents? Well, 
it's very interesting having a picture of the evidence available in the field that this is one of the fields with the largest amount of, of available evidence. Uh, overall, we reach over one, almost 100,000 patients randomized in randomized controlled trials comparing different revascularization strategies. And you see here the accumulation of evidence over the last 40 years. So within the context of the guidelines for myocardial revascularization of the European Society of Cardiology, we performed a network meta-analysis to provide an updated uh, status of revascularization in the field, trying to compare treatment strategies, meaning revascularization strategies, with medical therapy in patients with coronary artery disease, with the objective to inform the guidelines. What is a network meta-analysis? It's actually a quite sophisticated statistical tool which allows to uh, integrate direct comparisons with indirect comparisons. I will not go, go into too much details of the methodology of this tool, but it's quite a a modern and powerful tool that can provide important information uh, with the aim of synthesizing the available evidence. So what we did here was to include in this analysis 100 randomized trials with 93,000 patients randomized. And you see here the treatment strategies that were compared from coronary artery bypass surgery to balloon angioplasty, bare metal stents, early generation drug looting stents and new generation drug looting stents, as well as medical therapy. And the primary endpoint of the analysis was all-cause mortality, which you see summarized in this slide. All revascularization strategies were compared against medical therapy. And what we observed was, first of all, we confirmed the mortality benefit associated with coronary revascularization by a surgical approach, meaning coronary artery bypass surgery, which you see up here. This was already shown 20 years back. But what, what we also observed was a progressive improvement on, in terms of the impact of mortality associated with improvement in PCI technologies. With no difference in mortality between PCI and medical therapy, with early generation PCI techniques as well as early generation drug looting stents, However, a uh, beneficial effect on mortality of new generation drug looting stents, certainly with wide confidence interval, but at the same time uh, on the significant level of the bar. And this was the basis for the uh, European Society of Cardiology Myocardial Revascularization Guidelines published two years ago, uh, which actually I had the pleasure to participate to. And you see that this evidence had, were the basis for these guidelines uh, supporting a class of recommendation, one for uh, revascularization as compared to medical therapy in patients with uh, symptomatic coronary artery disease or with evidence of ischemia. So now it comes to which strategy to revascularize. So we must revascularize our patients. However, shall we use PCI or shall we use coronary artery bypass surgery, which you can see mainly depicted in this cartoon. And uh, this is an eterni eternal dilemma. There is a huge amount of evidence on the topic. I will try to quickly touch upon it. And I think that to go to discuss this issue, we need to start from this, the findings of this registry published in the New England Journal in 2012. This is a registry of the STS and ACCF, uh, so American registries, in which patients uh, undergoing coronary artery bypass surgery were compared against patients undergoing PCI through propensity score matching. So uh, overall, there was a beneficial effect of coronary artery bypass surgery, but this is not what I want to stress upon of this registry. Rather than out of 2 million patients that were included in the registry, only 10% of those, meaning 200,000 patients, were uh, including the propensity score match analysis. What does this mean? That in 90% of cases, due to comorbidities, due to other risk uh, factors, the patients were directly assigned to coronary artery bypass surgery or PCI. The, when we discuss whether the optimal revascularization strategy is surgical or percutaneous, we're talking of a tiny slice of patients, less than 10% of the patients that we are discussing. 
Well, so regarding this 10% of patients, I think that one of the most informative trials is the Syntax trial, which compared early generation drug eluting stents against cabbage. And what was seen at five years follow up was that there was a, a similar risk between PCI with drug eluting stents and cabbage in patients at a low degree of anatomical complexity of disease. Whereas in patients with more complex disease, the benefit of cabbage was evident. What was also interesting in this trial was that they, the uh, authors provided a pre-specified analysis of the subgroup of patients with left main disease, which is the most important among the coronary arteries. And what was interesting was that in this subgroup, the benefit of PCI in terms of having similar outcomes to cabbage was extended to patients with also a moderate complexity of disease. Since then, um, the guidelines were published, mainly focusing on the re results of this trial and reflected them in terms of recommendations and level of evidence, therefore providing the same class of recommendation for patients with left main disease and simple anatomical complexity, while uh, a favorable recommendation for cabbage in patients with left main disease and more complex anatomical complexity. However, Two weeks ago, two major trials were published on the topic comparing new generation drug eluting stents as compared to cabbage in patients with left main disease. And we have the Excel trial on the left side of this slide published in the New England Journal of Medicine which showed non-inferiority between uh, PCI with new generation Everolimus eluting stents and cabbage at three years follow-up in terms of the primary composite endpoint of death, stroke, or myocardial infarction. And on the other side, we had instead a trial with kind of contrasting results. A smaller trial, meaning uh, almost half of the Excel, this was a noble trial, a Scandinavian trial, which instead showed a inferiority result for PCI with another new generation drug eluting stent as compared to cabbage for a slightly different primary endpoint since beyond including death stroke and myocardial infarction, it also included repeat revascularization. So in an attempt to resolve this contrast uh, here at Humanitas with some American colleagues, we performed an updated meta-analysis which is currently submitted, uh, including uh, the available RCTs comparing drug eluting stents with coronary artery bypass surgery and focusing on individual components of the respective primary endpoints. And you see actually that uh, according to this meta-analysis which includes uh, almost 5,000 patients with quite precise risk estimates, there appears to be no difference between percutaneous coronary interventions with drug eluting stents and coronary artery bypass surgery with respect to all cause death, myocardial infarction and stroke but a benefit favoring coronary artery bypass surgery during long-term follow-up as it relates to repeat revascularization. And I wish to close this talk with a glimpse on future outlook. So where are we going next? Since actually the results with PCI and current generation drug eluting stents are optimal at this point in time, but certainly there is a field that is continuing to progress. Well, I think that I wish to uh, touch upon three main topics looking at the future. And uh, uh, the first one is focusing on distribution of adverse events over time after contemporary PCI. And you do see here that looking both at cardiac death or MI and stent thrombosis, there is an overall very acceptable rate of adverse events at two years follow-up. But looking at the distribution, you see that over 50% occur within the first 30 days after uh, the implantation of a coronary stent. The second aspect, which relates to the uh, long-term follow-up of these patients, is to understand whether at late events are related to the implanted stent or rather to progression of coronary artery disease. We know that coronary artery disease is a chronic disease. Once you treat a lesion, the problem might not be at the lesion that you treated, but rather at other coronary segments that were not treated. And what was interesting in this analysis that I published during my time in Bern was that uh, at four years follow-up, the great majority of adverse events appear to be related not to the initially treated lesion, but to progression of coronary artery disease at not treated time, uh, not treated sites. 
And the third aspect that needs to be considered is the development of new technologies for the treatment of coronary artery disease, namely fully birosorbable stents. These are stents made of polymeric materials or uh, also um, metallic materials, meaning magnesium, magnesium alloys, which have the characteristics of dissolving over time, meaning bioresorbed, with the potential of restorating the vascular physiology of the vessel. Of course, we are talking about a field that it's still under development, and discussing these technologies would require an entire lesson, but uh, uh, I think that it's important to be aware that there is a continuous progress of the field in this direction. So considering these three points, meaning uh, early and acute events, uh, events related and not related to initially implanted stent, and the development of the field with new devices, I think that future strategies for optimization of clinical outcomes after revascularization are mainly uh, focusing on two aspects, so the prevention of early events and the prevention of late events. As for early events, we are focusing on the optimization of PCI techniques and post-PCI medical management. As it relates to late events instead, we should rather focus on prevention of disease progression at non-treated coronary segments. And uh, in this respect, I quickly show you uh, uh, two studies that we are uh, starting here at Humanitas. One is the POEM trial, which focuses on a high-risk population, meaning high-risk ble high bleeding patients, in which we try to optimize uh, the therapy after PCI with respect to antiplatelet therapy. And the other one instead is a study that is currently being submitted for a grant application at uh, uh, the Ministry of Health. And it's instead focusing on the evaluation of coronary artery disease progression in another high-risk population, meaning patients with acute coronary syndromes and diabetes mellitus. So, in conclusion, where are we now? Well, certainly coronary drug eluting stent represent an important progress in percutaneous coronary interventions. Technological advances in drug eluting stents technology improved safety and efficacy outcomes of percutaneous coronary interventions, and available evidence supports the use of metallic drug eluting stents in most clinical settings without safety concerns. Which are the future challenges? Well, first, optimizing PCI techniques. Second, optimizing post-PCI medical management. The third one is definitely preventing disease progression. I really think that we will never stop stressing enough on this point. And finally, identifying vulnerable blood plaques, meaning plaques that are prone to uh, erosion or rupture and therefore determining thrombotic events. And I wish to uh, conclude thanking all the people that have been working in, with me during the last seven years. Well, first of all, my mentors, Stefan Windecker, University of Bern, Carlo Patrono, uh, Catholica, University of Rome, and Gianluigi Condorelli. And certainly all the group of the uh, cardiology here at Humas Humanitas Research Hospital, starting from Bernard Reimers, as well as, of course, all my colleagues at Bern University Hospital, with whom I have been sharing the cath lab for f almost five years. And finally, two groups with whom I have been collaborating a lot, uh, Roxana Mera and, Mount, and Usman Baber at Mount Sinai School of Medicine in New York, and Adnan Kastradi and Robert Byrne at Deutsches Heart Centrum in Munich. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you.